Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of serving as your moderator this evening as we explore the fantastic city of Florence with a very special guest. It is going to be Rick. He is back with us after some travels and excited to tour you all around the city that kicked off the Renaissance. And to guide us on that adventure, I am going to turn things over to our tour guide for this evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Gabe, thank you so much. And yeah, we're going to go to Florence and I'm in a very good mood. I've been uh, I've been uh, letting my Barbaresco breathe and I've been sampling it, I've got to admit. And I'm in just a beautiful mood. It's nice to be together. It's nice to be back on Monday Night Travel. I'm so thankful for the work that, that Gabe and, and Lisa and Julianne and Ben are doing every Monday, bringing us great travels on Monday Night Travel. And I'm glad I'm able to drop by every once in a while and share with you what's going on. Hey, I was just in Milwaukee this morning and I spent a couple of days in Milwaukee. Uh, I was uh, hosting my, I was on stage with the Milwaukee Symphony Orchestra doing our Europe, a symphonic journey concert. And we had two full houses in Milwaukee. I was so excited about that. And it's the 10th anniversary of this show we made for public television, Rick Steves Europe, a symphonic journey. And it takes you to seven different countries with a grand finale with Beethoven's Ode to Joy, celebrating patriotic national anthem type music of little countries that are earning their freedom in the Romantic age in the late 1800s. If you are curious about that show, I've just been thinking how cool this is. It is available on our website. You can just go to the TV section and watch the special. It's a one hour special. Uh, and um, you go to ricksteves.com, go to the TV section, look in the specials, and you will find something called the Symphonic Journey. Um, I'm going to be going to Grand Rapids later on this summer. I'm going to be going to Boston, playing at the Boston Pops. Uh, I was there three or four years ago, and we had two great evenings, and they've invited me back to do a new version of the Symphonic Journey. And then we'll be performing the Symphonic Journey right here uh, in uh, north of Seattle at the, Sim at the Cascade Symphony Orchestra in December. So lots of classical music tied in with our love of Europe. Uh, last night, I was given a talk for Milwaukee PBS um, there in Milwaukee to their supporters. And I saw a lot of people with my Keep On Traveling t-shirt. And it just made me so happy because people are keeping on traveling and we're ready to go. And I thought, as a matter of fact, I would put these uh, t-shirts on sale tonight. So if I could just jump right in for a plug for this, I just think this is a joyful t-shirt and people love to wear it. And it normally sells for 20 bucks, but I called up headquarters today and I said, can we put it on sale for half price? And I was reminded, well, we'll lose money if we sell it at half price. And I said, let's lose some money. <laughs> I just think it's great to have you keep on traveling t-shirt. So if you'd like to keep on traveling t-shirt, um, it's for 24 hours. It's at this blowout price for 10 bucks. So check that out. Um, last night, it was so fun to get back on the stage with the full house of travelers giving my how to travel lecture and what's going on in Europe. Um, I've got a lot of lectures coming up over the course of the year. I'm going to be visiting TV stations, public television stations. And whenever I do, I love to let them gather a crowd of people, make a little money for their local TV station. And I can get people up to date with all the latest on European travel. I've got lectures booked for uh, Grand Rapids, Boston, Twin Cities, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Dayton, Cincinnati, L.A., San Francisco, and Sacramento so far. Uh, I will remind you there later on there. Most of those are in November. The seats are not tickets are not open yet, but we will let you know when they're coming up. But we're going to be giving talks all over the country because we're pretty excited about travel. You know, I've been to Europe, I think, four times in the last year since we opened the floodgates after the pandemic. Um, and, you know, people are wondering, is it what's it like in Europe right now? I'm going to take just five minutes to get you up to date on Europe before we get into our travels for the evening. But, um, you know, COVID, we don't know if COVID is going to be here this summer or not. Um, I'm feeling like we're going to travel through COVID like we did last year. I think it's just going to get better than last year. We took 25,000 people on our Rick Steves tours last year. And I'm saying that because that gives me a sampling. These were 25,000 Americans traveling in Europe, all over Europe on 40 different itineraries. How many people tested positive for that uh, during that period last year? 4%. That's a lot of people, one out of every 25. So a thousand people basically tested positive. As far as I know, nobody went to the hospital, nobody went to the doctor, 
everybody just had to leave the tour. When they leave the Rick Steves tour, when they test positive, they have to get off the bus for everybody else's safety. We give them back the money for the part of the tour they did not complete, and then they isolate and they travel on on their own. So that's kind of a COVID roulette, one out of 25 chance. Um, But the good news is, as far as we know, nobody had to do anything other than isolate until they tested negative, and then they get back out there and they travel on. What are the what are the consequences of COVID as we travel on? Europe is really um, into making you book things in advance so they can control crowds. So I would remind you, a lot of the major sites in Europe, they don't even have their ticket office open anymore. You got to book online. So before you go to a city, do your homework. Any guidebook will explain to you, or you can learn about it online or whatever. But if you're going to a city, understand what needs to be booked in advance and what you can just show up for. That is very important. Otherwise, it's a staffing challenge. Staffing in airports, staffing in restaurants, staffing you know, on tour companies, you name it. Um, it's, it's, it's complicated these days to do the staffing like you would like to before COVID. And the consequence there is a little bit of chaos in the airports. If you want to skate through the airports with minimal problems, don't check a bag, get there early, give yourself a little extra time for your connections when you're booking those connections and do whatever you can online before you get to the airport. That way, I think you'll minimize your your frustrations at the airport. I've had no trouble at the airport because I never check a bag. That makes things go easier. Hey, big news for us, we have renamed Eastern Europe. We've called, we're calling it now Central Europe the way it should be. I want to remind you, we Americans are wired to see Europe with a line right down the middle, the Cold War. You remember the Iron Curtain? You had the Free West and the Communist East. The Warsaw Pact was in the East. Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and so on. Well, those countries we thought of as the East for 50 years of the Cold War, but really that's Central Europe. And, you know, before the, you know, the Soviet Union took over those countries, they weren't, there wasn't an Iron Curtain. That was Central Europe. And today the Cold War is ancient history. And we're going to call that area Central Europe again, even though from a marketing point of view for selling books and tours, the American consumer and the tourist thinks of those countries as Eastern Europe, but they're really not. The people who live there don't think of themselves as Eastern Europe. They are Central Europeans. There is an Eastern Europe, and that would be Georgia, that would be um, Belarusia, that would be Ukraine, and that would be Russia. Uh, That's Eastern Europe. Uh, So remember that there is a, I think, a respect issue. You want to call what we think of as Eastern Europe, Central Europe. Other news, the dollar is strong. I think it's a dollar seven for a euro. Uh, There's been pretty steep inflation in Europe, just like here, maybe 10% a year or something like that. But the strength of our dollar pretty much negates the hit we're going to take because of inflation when we go to Europe. And I think given the strength of our dollar, it's a good time to go. Uh, Anticipate crowds. Europe, the big discussion in 2019 before COVID hit was the crowds. And I would say the big discussion next, this coming year, 2023, should be, what are you going to do about the crowds? It's, uh, you know, I just talked with our publisher. Our books are selling as well right now as they did in 2019. Our tours are selling better right now than they did in 2019. People are going back. And what's more critical now than before, Americans just insist on all going to the same place. We got this, we're trying to get herd immunity. We've already got herd mentality. Everybody's doing the crowdsourcing. Everybody's doing the Instagram shots at the same spot. And consequently, yeah, there's a lot of crowds in Europe, but they're all clumped together. And if you can break yourself away from that, free yourself from that, and go where you want to go instead of where everybody else is going, you'll solve a lot of the crowd problem just with that. But be mindful of the crowds in Europe. Um, I think that's my main update for European travel. I'm feeling really good about traveling. I'm, I'm going on, I've already got three trips booked. In the spring, in, in May, I'm going to be researching and updating our guidebooks in Spain and southern France with a little dip into Morocco. And then in July, I'm going to be meeting the TV crew, and we're going to make two shows on Iceland. And then I'll be visiting all the major cities in Scandinavia and Estonia, updating that material. And then in September, I'm going to go back and we'll meet the crew again, and we'll make two shows in Poland. And then I hope to go to Istanbul and Morocco for a couple of weeks. So lots of travels coming up. Stay tuned. If you want to know about any of that stuff, remember... Uh, at Rick Steves on Facebook, we're always crowing about this stuff. So you can just drop into Facebook. Hey, I put together a fun, oh, I want another sip of this Barbaresco. Hope you've got a nice uh, glass of wine there or whatever you like to drink. 
Wow. Nebbiolo, that's this grape. If you like Barolo, if you like Barbaresco, they're both from Piedmont. They're both very similar, and they both are 100% Nebbiolo grapes. It's full-bodied. In Italian, that is corposo. And when you're going to have a full-bodied wine, you want a strong cheese, something like a gargonzola. So I'm going to be nibbling my fancy strong cheese, and I'm going to be sipping my wine as we travel. A little bit of before the Italy show, I've got a couple of video clips. I actually took a family vacation a couple of weeks ago, went to New Orleans. I love New Orleans. I've got a kind of a, the most creative person I think I know. She's sort of a flower child, hippie artist, in love with life, uh, sweetest soul, Nicolina. And uh, we've uh, featured her, some of her art. She does street art all over the world. And uh, she lives in New Orleans with a bunch of very creative people. And she's been begging me to come down to New Orleans. So my girlfriend Shelly and I went down. We had a great couple of days. Carnival was going on. And Nikki put together just a little two-minute clip. Let me just take you to New Orleans. This is, um, we didn't do any standard sightseeing. It was sort of um, just hanging out with Nikki and all of her crazy friends. Uh, I was met at the airport, typical of Nikki, by a guy playing a piano lashed to the back of a pickup truck. And then went down and there was like parades everywhere. Uh, we took walking tours, great walking tour of the French Quarter, great walking tour of street art. Um, I like this, this um, jazz band called uh, Tuba Skinny. I've been watching them just on YouTube. I love Tuba Skinny. And it just happened that Tuba Skinny was playing at Nikki's favorite bar. So we'll see a little bit of Tuba Skinny there. And um, the theme of the song is enjoy yourself. It's later than you think. My niece thinks I work too hard and she's trying to teach me to just enjoy the moment. If you want more on this, again, we always have more clips and more, more information on our Rick Steves Facebook page. But let me share this with you right now. And I'd love to take you to New Orleans just for two minutes. Thanks to my beautiful niece, Nicolina. Enjoy yourself. It's later than you think. Enjoy yourself. You're gonna take that ocean trip, no matter come what may. You've got your reservations made, but you just can't get away. Next year for sure you'll see the world, you'll really get around. But how far can you travel when you're six feet underground? Enjoy yourself. It's later than you think You never go to nightclubs and You just don't care to dance You don't have time for silly things Like moonlight and romance You only think of dollar bills Tied neatly in a stack But when you kiss a dollar bill It doesn't kiss you back Enjoy yourself, it's later than you think. Enjoy yourself, while you're still in the pink. The years go by, as quickly as a wink. Enjoy yourself, enjoy yourself, it's later. Experience. Woo! Our pleasure. Enjoy. Thank you, Bo. <laughs> All right. Well, it's nice to have. It, it occurred to me, I rarely 
travel and not stay in a hotel. And it was fun just to crash with relatives and see some of our beautiful country. Um, hey, right now, I just want to continue to warm you up a little bit with some teasers. When we start our TV shows, we do what's called a tease. Every time we catch your attention by doing something fun and then you don't quite know where we are until we say, and we are in, but um. So this is just a fun little game. You could call it a drinking game if you want. I've got my Barbaresco here, so I'm gonna take a sip as we guess which one it is. But here we have, I think, five teases, and I'll let each of you try to guess where we are. There's a little, I put in a four or five second pause so you can talk it over with your travel partners and see where the heck we are. Here we go, the tease. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're really on the edge. Stay with us as we explore the best. Hmm, where could that be? Of Northern Ireland. That's a beautiful part of the coast. It's called the Antrim Coast. A number of great attractions up there, including this wonderful hanging bridge that goes to a, a, a bird sanctuary. It's just a wonderful place for birding on the north coast of Ireland. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time... Okay, this is a little tough, but it's a fancy Gothic church where the tourists are welcome to go on the roof. That's the most accessible fancy Gothic roof in Europe. It's the last stage of Gothic called flamboyant Gothic, over the top, just so much decoration. Where are we? We're in North Italy, enjoying the lofty and inspiring heights of Milano. Ah, Thanks for joining us. There we go, Milano. Does Jackson like shrimp? He does. Whoa. That dog's named Jackson, and Shelly and my dog's named Jackson, too. Somehow they're cousins, but where is this dog? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're down on the beach, got a good cold beer, and the shrimp's on the barbie. It must be. This is a land where they're really into cozy, hugly, hugly. Little, look at the little cabins there on the beach. They're just so cozy, they're hoogly. And we're sitting there with the mayor of this town having a barbecue. I love this town. I write it up. We visit it on our tours. The best of Denmark. Thanks for joining us. It's aeroscoping. That's the little island in the south of Denmark. It's so sweet. He likes that. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. And this time we're in the very southwest tip of... The very southwest tip. What country is really in to the southernmost and the northernmost tip? Hmm. Great Britain. It's Land's End. And we're exploring England's Cornwall. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe, and this time we're filling up on some unforgettable culture. Holy cannoli, we're in. Now this is pretty easy, you gotta get this one. And I'll tell you, if you've never been excited about cannoli, you gotta go here at its birthplace and try it. Always have the cannoli with the ricotta stuffed right there instead of in advance. And then it's just so fresh and crispy. Where are we? I love it. Sicily, thanks for joining us. Oh yeah. Well, something else I wanna share with you. I'm just pulling out all my little, little party favors here. We've been doing TV now. I was just at Milwaukee PBS. They were celebrating their 65th year on the air, 65 years. And uh, they invited me over and we had a big party and all their VIPs were there and everything and all their supporters. And it occurred to me, I've been bringing TV to public television for uh, just about exactly half of that time, 32 or 33 years. And uh, when we started doing TV, it was square and low def or standard def. And then of course, 20 years ago, it went widescreen and high def. And we had to redo all the shows we'd done before, make them better, make them widescreen, make them high def. And now we've got them where they're just looking sparkly new um, for the rest of our days, I think. Uh, but here, I made a little point of going back and forth 25 years ago and then right up to the present time. And you can see the square images of me 25 years ago and the wide images with the high def. But you'll notice 
In a lot of cases, the information just stays the same. Join us now as we discover the ins and outs of travels in Europe. So that was the open of our very first show back in the 19, early 1990s. The people of the Cinque Terre know the weather by the wind. Bellissima giornata. Una bellissima giornata. It is nice. Yes, but I think that the weather will be changed. So I'm lucky I've got the same friends over all these decades. So uh, it's just beautiful to be able to go, hey, let's go down to the beach, Piero, and do it again. The weather's changing, I think. Yes, uh, now we come uh, Scirocco from the Egypt. The hot wind, and tomorrow will be the Libecio. They put the storm in Vernazza. From the southwest? From yes, Libya, from the yeah. southwest, yes. And uh, after this storm, uh, the wind changed again. Will be the wind from the mountains, called Tramontana. The wind from the north, called Tramontana. Tramontana. This wind uh, coming down from the north and cleaning the sky will be uh, again Una bellissima giornata. So, if you know the wind in Cinque Terre, you don't need a weatherman. In Cinque Terre, if you know the wind, you don't need a weatherman. So every time I see him when I'm in the Cinque Terre, to this day, when I see him, I go, if you know the wind, he says, you don't need no weatherman. Hey, now we're going to go to Florence. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us. And uh, I'm so excited about Florence because it's a big part of our art series. And I uh, pulled from three different TV shows here, some clips that will give you a fun look at Florence. And this is from our show called uh, Florentine Delights. In this episode, we'll enjoy some of the treasures of the Florentine Renaissance. And we'll see the city in a wider context from ancient to modern. Then we'll side trip to a couple of rival cities and cultural capitals in their own right, Pisa and Lucca. In Florence, and I wanted to mention Pisa and Luca because I think they're great side trips, but we're not going there today. We're just going to go to Florence. But remember, you've got access to all these shows, including this show in its entirety, in our library of TV shows at ricksteves.com. It's always there. It's free. It's just a click away. And then you can go to Pisa and Luca. I think the two of the best side trips, they're just an hour away from Florence. But we're sticking to Florence. We'll be wowed by Michelangelo. Eat and drink well with my friend Bobo. I'm working. <laughs> and get to know the Medici dynasty through the art of the Palazzo Vecchio. Then we hop a train, side tripping to marvel at a tipsy tower, circle a city on its ramparts, survey the realm from atop a tree capped tower, and enjoy some Puccini in his hometown. Italy, about the size of Arizona, is made of many distinct regions. We're in Tuscany, exploring its capital, Florence, before side-tripping to Pisa and then to Lucca. Florence was the epicenter of the Renaissance, that cultural explosion that propelled Europe out of the Middle Ages and into an economic, intellectual, and artistic boom time. This is the city where civic pride, an abundance of genius, lots of wealth, and a passion for merging art and science ushered in an age of humanism. In the space of a couple generations, Florence gave us Brunelleschi's Dome, Leonardo's Mona Lisa, and Michelangelo's David. This remarkable town, with just about 60,000 people in the 15th century, would help lead Europe into the modern age. It's interesting, you know, we, a lot of people like to say, follow the money. Well, if you're looking at art and you're wondering the story behind the art, follow the money. You can't have an art boom without money. And the Medici family who ruled Florence for generations from palaces like this was loaded. It was the Medici wealth, they were bankers, along with their passion for art and their supersized egos that helped Florence fund the Renaissance and make this city the art capital of the Western world. The statues in their garden are a reminder that it was in Florence that art was first commissioned simply to be enjoyed by a wealthy elite. With the Renaissance, you had art not just to teach Bible stories or to glorify kings. Now, rich people sponsored art just for art's sake. 
I mean, this is really a big deal. That's a rich person's courtyard and they've got statues in there, not decorating some church or anything like that, just for the sake of art, art for art's sake. Florence has some great palaces. This is the Medici Riccardi Palace, uh, part of the Medici sort of domain. Uh, the most famous and touristy palace is the Palazzo Vecchio. It looks a lot like this. It's on the main square. We'll go to that later, but it's famous and crowded. We're going into this palace now, and this is one of those more offbeat places that we just love to recommend in our books and on our tours. Let's go inside. The art-loving Medici hosted lots of famous artists, philosophers, and poets. Imagine, a teenage Michelangelo lived with them, almost as an adopted son. Leonardo da Vinci played the lute at their parties, and Botticelli actually studied the classical statues that dotted their gardens. Today, the plush world of the Medici is on display in their palaces. This lavishly frescoed family chapel takes you back to Florence at least the Florence of its aristocratic class, in the 1400s. The walls around the altar display the Journey of the Magi, or Three Kings, on their way to Bethlehem by Benozzo Gozzoli. Showing no shortage of ego, a Medici prince portrays himself as one of the Three Kings. This is an idealized image of Lorenzo the Magnificent, leading a parade of Florentines through a rocky landscape Rather than the Holy Land, the scene is set in 15th century Tuscany. Behind the king are other family members, along with the cities rich and powerful of the day. These elegant Florentine dandies are actually realistic portraits, showing the leading characters of Florence around 1450. They're wearing colorful clothes that set trends throughout Europe. You know, look at the people. The, the faces here are just so real. I just want to go back even. That is the people of Florence 500 years ago. And these are the people that, 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 that ignited that cultural explosion that brought us out of the Middle Ages and sort of introduced us to the modern age. It's so exciting to, to humanize the Renaissance by seeing the people in the art. <laughs> The chapel doubled as a place the Medici received important guests. And by portraying their family in this religious setting, the Medici made an impressive display of power and sophistication. When potential rivals would drop by and see this, they could only think, damn, those Medici are good. Powerful as they were, the Medici were mortal, like everyone else, and eventually ended up down the street at San Lorenzo in a grander Medici chapel, which served as the family tomb. Designed by Michelangelo at the height of his creative powers, this richly decorated room, created completely under one artist's control, is an innovative ensemble of architecture, tombs, and sculpture. Michelangelo, who personally knew three of the four family members buried here, was emotionally attached to the project. This is the work of a middle-aged man reflecting on his contemporaries dying all around him. And it seems to me, reflecting on the tension between humanism salvation and his own mortality. The room is strikingly empty of Christian iconography. Lorenzo II is shown as a Roman general, seated, arm resting on a Medici money box and bowing his head in contemplation. His sarcophagus bears two reclining statues, metaphors for birth and death. Dusk, worn out after a long day, slumps his chin on his chest and reflects on the day's events. Dawn stirs restlessly after a long night as though waking from a dream. Opposite, on the tomb of Lorenzo's brother, Giuliano, Michelangelo portrays night and day. The woman representing night looks almost masculine, reflecting Michelangelo's passion for capturing the musculature of the human body. The man, representing day, struggles to be comfortable, each limb twisting in a different direction. These statues represent the swift passage of time, which eventually overtakes everyone, even the most powerful. Day, night, dawn, and dusk, brought to life in this room by the greatest sculptor of the Renaissance, meditate eternally on death. 
On the city's main square stands the Palazzo Vecchio, Florence's city hall. While the exterior is medieval, Michelangelo's David, this one's a replica, seems to welcome you into the Renaissance world and the dawn of our modern age. So now when we look at David there, that, that's, that's where Michelangelo's David originally went. I mean, this is obviously a copy and the precious original is in a museum nearby. But when we look at David, we got to remember that's that's the mascot of Florence. Uh, you know, the, the shepherd boy killed the giant because God, you know, he, of his faith in God and God empowered him. Uh, in fact, look how big that right hand is. That's that's the hand of God that helped David slay the giant. Well, that's Florence's uh, mascot because Florence could rise above its bully city state neighbors, just like David rose above the giant. Uh, it's so important to understand who paid for the art and why, what was going on. Now we're gonna step inside of this amazing palace and we're gonna see more city propaganda art. It's just wallpapering the Medici Palace. This was the city hall, the main center of the city government. And it's all about making the Medici believably worthy to rule the city. Our modern age. The elaborate courtyard with its Roman inspired decoration is textbook Renaissance. The enormous main hall is designed to impress 500 guests at the same time. In an age before it was possible to buy mass media, this was how you shaped public opinion. The art trumpeted the glory of Florence, thanks to the Medici. The frescoes recall great military victories. Florence beating Pisa, 1497. Florence trouncing Siena in 1555. The ceiling heralds the divine glory of the Grand Duke Cosimo de' Medici. Dressed as an emperor and blessed by the Pope, he was the first Medici to rule like a king. In front, you've got Leo X, the first of three Medici popes, giving the family some nice connections in both Rome and heaven, and explaining how the Medici family became the bankers of the Vatican. The hall is flanked by statues showing the heroic labors of Hercules, a mortal who became a half-god through his labors. A parallel not lost on wild Florentines. Again, you gotta be impressed by those Medici. Okay, so you gotta be impressed by those Medici. Damn, those Medici were good. But they weren't quite audacious enough to be divine you know, like Louis XIV, uh, they were half divine, like Hercules. It's so important, you know, when you go into these palaces to have, have a guide that can explain that to you because you're surrounded by all of this stuff that really made sense to the citizens of that town back when this was made. Hey, um, <laughs> damn, those Medici are good. And so is this Barbaresco. Um, actually, I'm going to stop sharing just for a minute here and take a breather. We're going to carry on. Uh, but right now, I want to remind you, it's so great to be here on Monday Night Travel. And we couldn't be here without our wonderful Monday Night Travel crew. I want to thank Gabe. I want to thank Lisa. I want to thank Julianne. And I want to thank Ben. These guys are here every Monday. We've got 100 episodes of Monday Night Travel on our archives. And you know, when I'm around the country giving lectures, more and more, I'm relying on this as a body of content. Of course, we have, we have, what do we have, like 700 hours of radio. Every week we have a radio show that airs on public radio in 500 different stations around the country. We've got 150 TV shows, and that's all on our website. Uh, we've got all the TV and video material we have cut into little streamable clips, little three, four, five minute clips for teachers. It's called Classroom Europe. Check that out. We've got lectures on, you name it, we've got a, uh, lectures on technology for travel, how to use your mobile phone, how to, you know, about the cruising industry in the Mediterranean, about packing light, about languages. We've got language lessons. I've got um, a two hour lecture on just about every country in Europe on our website at ricksteves.com. And now we've got a hundred hours of Monday night travel. If somebody, if I mention, oh yeah, I hiked around Mount Blanc, it was a great vacation. Uh, you know, I hired a company and it was a very inexpensive tour and they provided the hotels and the dinners and the service to, to Sherpa my bag from one hotel to the next. And every day I'd hike over a ridge into the next valley, meet my hotel, have a great dinner, my bags are waiting for me. You kind of go, I want to know more. 
Well, that's a one hour Monday night travel special. I'm going to Morocco. I missed the show we did a few weeks ago in Morocco. I can just click right through and I've got one hour of information on Morocco. So much good content there. So check that out. I want to remind you, every time we take clips of these shows, you can see the show uninterrupted by going into the TV section at ricksteves.com. I also want to remind you that uh, Lisa is behind the scenes right now uh, handling the questions. She's doing her best to answer the questions as they come along and she'll be gathering questions for me to answer after we're done with the video. So if you got a question about anything, be sure to go into the Q&A section and if you go to the chat section, Gabe works very hard to get really handy links. So whatever you might be inspired by in the show, you've got more information right there. Just click on through. And a very inspiring link right there is our link directly to our web store where you can find that for 24 hours, this Keep On Traveling t-shirt is half price, 10 bucks, and you're part of the family. If you feel joyful that we're going back to Europe, you might want to sport this cool shirt. Again, it's on sale half price, and you'll have a link in the chat section. I want to remind you also that this wine gets better with air. I've let it breathe now for nearly an hour, and uh, as soon as I sipped it right away, I thought, I like wines that start with B. Have you ever thought of how many cool wines start with B? Brunello di Montalcino, Barolo, Burgundy, Bordeaux, Bandol. I, I'm going to the south of France. I love Bandol. It's the great wine around, around uh, Marseille. And this is Barbaresco. Barbaresco is a grape that's not so famous for us. Nebbiolo, N-E-B-B-I-O-L-O. -B -B it's a dry red wine. It's full-bodied. And um, because it's full-bodied, it goes nice with a strong cheese. I'm nibbling with a cheese. And that's one thing I learned from my buddy Fred Plotkin is how artfully Italians match flavors. You know, a full-bodied red wine, gorgonzola. It's perfect. Um, I got to be honest, I googled, I'm not that good on wine, so I don't know all this stuff without doing a little study. And I googled a Barbaresco, and it said it tastes like you got little flavors of, of cherry, truffles, fennel, licorice, it's spicy. And then with that help, I sipped it, and I, indeed, I can enjoy those flavors. And it said, this is a wine that ages well. This happens to be from 2008. So that's, that's, that's a few years ago. And it gets more smoky and earthy with age, like a lot of us. And uh, that's what this is. It's smoky. Yeah, Barbaresco. Mm. It's uh, the sister of Barolo. You probably have heard of Barolo maybe more than Barbaresco. They're both from Piedmont in the north of Italy. And they're both with these Nebbiolo. Uh, grapes. Hey, speaking of delicious taste treats, I think it's time for a little bit of food right now. And a fun thought that I have when I'm in Florence is a backpacker staying in a youth hostel today can very reasonably eat better than the Medici did 500 years ago. There's so many opportunities to eat really good when you're in Italy. And right now, we're going to go see exactly what I'm talking about. Back out on the streets, it's fun to think that today, even a tourist can eat better than the princes and dukes of centuries past. My son Andy's taking time out from his travels to join us for a convivial Florentine dinner at Trattoria Tito. My favorite restaurants in Europe have a common thread. They're run by people who love their work. And Bobo, with his grande personality, runs this place with exuberance. Tonight, we're going with his recommendation, the antipasto extravaganza. A parade of plates with wine to match. Knowing what I'll be eating, he recommends a wine that complements the food. Dry enough to clean the mouth with the salamis, with the fats of salamis. Bobo, the consummate professional, tests the wine to make sure. I think it's perfect. <laughs> okay. This is the pecorino cheese. Uh, we used to age it in caves for 12 months, and it's perfect to eat with the honey yeah. or with the fava beans. You have to get a fava bean, you have to break it, push out the bean, okay? That's nice. Eat it, and with a, with a, with a piece of pecorino cheese, it's perfect. 
See, Bobo knows this Italian concept of abbinamento. Ab abbinamento. It means that matching textures and tastes artfully. My co-author of our latest book, Italy for Food Lovers, Fred, knows exactly what Bobo is getting all excited about here. You know, the fava beans, the pecorino, the honey, all together, yes, with the right wine. You just want to scream yes. That's what we talk about with this book. You know, I've got, where's my Italy book? I mean, this is a fat book, the Italy book. I mean, I don't know, it's what, it's 1,200 pages or something. My, my publisher's going, okay, no more pages. Um, but this is this is our, our best-selling guidebook, Italy. This is 400 pages to complement that because this is all the art of Italian cuisine uh, with my buddy, Fred Plotkin, who's the go-to guy. He's the He's the consummate ex expert on Italian food. If you love Italy and if you love Italian food, check out this book. I'm very proud of it. I'm very thankful for my collaboration with Fred. And it's our big news this, uh, this spring because we are just debuting our Italy for Food Lovers book. And when I look at Bobo and I think of this restaurant, I can hardly wait to get back because every night I run around in these towns and I check out all these restaurants and make sure we got the very best in our guidebooks. <laughs> Bobo beans. takes a break from his busy schedule to make sure the wine will still complement the fava beans. What dedication. It's not a typical Florentine starter without mm. the bruschettas or crostini as we call them. We have crostini with uh, seasonal mushrooms and then the lard, lardo di colonnata, spicy with black pepper and rosemary. And then the bruschetta with fresh tomatoes, basil, olive oil and garlic. We have the typical Florentine liver pate. Uh, I think it's time to change the wine. I was and, just about uh, to suggest I that. Serve you a Syrah and it will be perfect with, uh, with the stronger cheeses and with the wild meats. Enjoy. I'm working. <laughs> Bobo certainly loves his work. Here you go. Okay, this is wild salamis. This is deer salami. This one is um, wild boar shoulder. This one is wild boar cheeks. Deer ham and wild boar sausages. Enjoy them with the wine. Oh boy, here comes another wine change. Hey, I want to remind you this, I, I don't know about you, but it just seems like an incredible meal to me. It is, it doesn't cost a fortune because I walked, I left my hotel and instead of turning left and walking into the center down by the Ponte Vecchio where all the tourists are, I turned right and I walked away from the tourists for 10 minutes. I had to walk 10 minutes to get away from the tourists in Florence. And I found a place that is packed with locals. We are the exception when a tourist steps into Bobo's place. And that's really the prize that I look for when I'm updating these books is finding a way for us to become temporary locals. And when we travel, we find new favorites. Uh, a lot of people are all excited about their tiramisu. I'll tell you, when it comes to dessert, for me, it's got to be Vinsanto and Biscotti. Check this out. Okay. Okay. This is the Vinsanto. And these are our homemade Florentine biscuits with almonds. So you dip them in the sweet. <laughs> look, at, look at the joy on my son's face. I, I just... I remember when I was a backpacker, and this is when Andy was a backpacker, and whenever we bump into each other, he gets to go out with me for a nice dinner. And I remember when I was his age, thinking, ah, oh, God, I wish I could go and have a nice dinner. Well, he hit the jackpot tonight. Wine for five seconds. Cinque. And then you eat them. The perfect end to a fantastic meal, thanks to Bobo. Civic pride and the Florentine celebration of good living enlivens the city streets to this day. Any time of year, a festival with centuries-old roots is likely to take you by surprise, as did this one here on Piazza della Signoria. Another grand meeting place, this time with ancient roots, is Piazza della Repubblica. This lonely ancient column reminds us that 2,000 years ago, this piazza was the Roman Forum. The Grand Square also evokes 19th century Florence. 
marked by a triumphal arch, it was built as a nationalistic statement celebrating the unification of Italy. That explains its name, Piazza of the Republic. So this is a very good example of the more you bring to your sightseeing, the more you'll enjoy it. I would imagine the vast majority of tourists, in fact, a lot of the locals, they have no idea about the importance of this square. But there was a five year period when Italy was the, the capital of Italy was Florence before it was fully united and they needed a, a, a beautiful, you know, regal kind of square. And they built this just exactly for that. Again, if you know what you're looking at, your sightseeing becomes much more rewarding and you can see a lot of history in the and into the little bits and pieces that survive in 2023. Florence reigned as the capital of a newly united Italy for just five years, from 1865 to 1870. That's when Rome was still Vatican territory. Florence lacked a square worthy of this grand new country, so this neighborhood, once a ramshackle Jewish ghetto, was torn down to open up a space for this imposing modern piazza. Today, the piazza, surrounded by stately buildings from the 19th century, is a fine place to enjoy a coffee or just feel the energy of contemporary Florence. While most of Florence's attractions cluster together in the old center, a short bus ride takes us to a much-loved medieval church. Set on a hill overlooking the city, it makes it clear there's more to Florence than Renaissance treasures. For a thousand years, the Church of San Miniato, still part of a functioning Benedictine monastery, has blessed the city that lies at the foot of its hill. The church predates the Renaissance by several centuries. Its marble facade, dating from the 12th century, is a classic example from the Romanesque period. The perfect symmetry is a reminder of the perfection of God. And the eagle on top, with bags of wool in his talons, reminds all who approach the church who paid for it. Ah, the wool guild. The wool guild, it, it is so, fun when you travel around to remember, just like we have, you know, big shot families with their name on our opera house in our cities. And, you know, the TV show was brought to you by the generous support of this or that business or this or that guild or this or that family. 500 years ago in Florence, the same thing. And when you look around, you see celebrated the people who funded this stuff. In this case, it was the wool guild. There was so much urban pride. By the way, I love when you're in the city so famous for Renaissance art. If you know where to look, you see there's great art there even from before the Renaissance. Let's go into this church now and see what I'm talking about. But this was centuries. This was 300 years before Michelangelo. Stepping inside, you enter the most exquisite holy space medieval Florentines could create. The carpet of marble actually dates from about 1200. The wood ceiling is repainted, showing off its original color scheme. This 14th century golden mosaic shows an earthly king offering his paltry secular crown to the king in heaven. Visitors are welcome to attend the sung mass, chanted as it has been by Benedictine brothers for centuries. In the adjacent sacristy, 14th century frescoes show scenes from the life of their founder and inspiration, Saint Benedict. Benedict is shown as an active force for good, busy blessing, preaching, and chasing the devil, until that day when he slides up the ramp to heaven. Oh, it was so heartbreaking, but that whole bit we just saw, I had to cut out of the art special. As you probably know, we've just finished a six hour mini series for public television. It's aired all around the country. It's called Rick Steves, The Art of Europe. And it was so exciting to bring the greatest hits of European art together in this six hour series. We had one hour for the Middle Ages and it was like one hour and three minutes. And I had to go back in and cut some things out. And this is one of those delightful clips that ended up on the cutting room floor. But if you think about it, I think this is a pretty cool little bit. And it didn't make the cut. There's a whole hour of medieval stuff that's even more important than that. I want to remind you, you can see our show, Rick Steves, Art of Europe. And wow, there's six different hours 
and you can see them anytime you want. If you just go to PBS uh, Passport, if you're a member of PBS, you can stream it that way. Or if you'd like, you can just go to ricksteves.com, go into the TV section, and you will see our art series. It's all there. It's free. And it is absolutely for the love of art. Benedict was the founder of the Benedictine Order, a vast network of over a thousand monasteries that eventually gave Europe some cohesiveness in the cultural darkness that followed the collapse of Rome. That's why Benedict is the patron saint of Europe. Well, San Miniato comes with commanding Florentine vistas. The nearby Piazzale Michelangelo, marked by its towering statue of David, is the city's most popular viewpoint. Crowds line the terrace, enjoying the cityscape of Florence. From here, you see the Arno River dividing the town center and the Ultra Arno district. Landmarks like the Ponte Vecchio and the city's beloved dome designed by Brunelleschi. It's a fine place to reflect on your Florentine visit. I just love that viewpoint. That's Piazza Michelangelo. And it's a short walk. You can see it's on the other side of the river, the Ultra Arno. All the, the heavy, heavy duty tourism is on the other side of the river. You cross the river, walk up to the hill, and that's uh, a good place for them. all the high school kids are up there on a cheap date. And all the TV crews are up there to get a great big wide view of Florence with the with the bridges and the, <laughs> oh, the beautiful city. Okay, well, that's um, th that's it for this episode. Uh, I do want to remind you from here in this episode, we go to Pisa and we go to Lucca. And uh, I think Florence is one of the few cities in Europe that actually merited two half-hour episodes in our uh, Rick Steves Europe series. Uh, but we're going to stay in Florence right now. We're going to jump to the other episode we did on Florence. And just it's three or four minutes from this show. But we're going to have some great food and we're going to enjoy the artisans on this side of the river, the Ultra Arno. Remember, all over Europe, if you go across the river in London, you know, you go to the, the, um, uh, the South Bank. Uh, you go in, in Paris, you got the, the Latin Quarter. Uh, in uh, Rome, you got Trastevere. In uh, Sevilla, you got Triana. Uh, in uh, Italy, in Florence, you've got Ultra Arno. You know, in the Wild West, you had the wrong side of the tracks. Back in medieval Europe, it was the wrong side of the river because they didn't have train tracks, they had rivers. That's what why places were built there. That's what brought the trade and the tax-free stuff, the people who weren't allowed into town, the non-conformists, the people who had the wrong religion, they're all on the other side of the river, the wrong side of the medieval tracks. Okay, we're going to go into the Ultra Arno now, and I'm so thankful when I'm doing my TV show that we've got, um, we've got uh, friends all over the place. And we're going to meet Tommaso, who runs one of my favorite hotels in Florence. It's called Hotel Devanzati. And of course, all of my favorite hotels and restaurants, I don't keep any secrets. They're in the books. So you can meet this guy and his dad and his mother who run this beautiful hotel. But right now, Tommaso is going to take us into the Ultra Arno. We're going to uh, do a little um, visiting of artisans. And the key word, I don't have a lot of uh, Italian words, but I do know Posso Guadare. Can I take a look? Step into a shop. You say, scusi, buongiorno, posso guardare? Si, sí, no problem. Okay, here we go. Posso guardare. I'm meeting my Florentine friend Tommaso at I Fratellini, a venerable hole in the wall much loved among locals for its tasty sandwiches and wine sold by the glass. Grazie. Thank you. And when you're done, you leave it on the rock. Boy, it's intense in the city. Yes, it is. Well, if you want to leave the tourists, let's cross the river. And let's go to where the real Florentines leave and work. What's that? The Old Toronto area. There's much more to this town than tourism, as you'll quickly find in the characteristic back lanes of the Old Toronto district. Artisans busy at work offer a rare opportunity to see traditional craftsmanship in action. You're welcome to just drop into little shops. But remember, it's polite to greet the proprietor. Your key phrase is, can I take a look? Posso guardare? Certo. Grazie. Here in this great city of art, there's no shortage of treasures in need of a little TLC. This is beautiful. How old is this painting? Uh, this is a 17th century painting. From uh, Florence? No. Mm, we, we don't know. Maybe huh? the area is Genova. Genova. Each shop addresses a need with passion and expertise. Fine instruments deserve the finest care. Grand palaces sparkle with gold leaf, thanks to the delicate and exacting skills of craftspeople like this. Yeah. 
A satisfying way to wrap up an Ultra Arno experience is to enjoy a Florentine steakhouse, which any Italian meat lover knows means Chianina beef. The quality is proudly on display. Steaks are sold by weight and generally shared. The standard serving is about a kilo for two, meaning about a pound per person. So both of those for four people. The preparation is simple and well established. Good luck if you want it well done. But I am hungry, yeah. Oh, look at this. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Kianina beef. So the, the meat is called Chianina. That's his name because it comes from the Chianti. Oh, from Chianti. Chianti. Okay. Exactly. And tell me about this concept of the good marriage uh, of the food. You know. Well, when you have a Chianina meat, you want to have some Chianti wine, and they go together well. Okay. They marry together. We say si sposano bene. Si sposano bene. A good exactly. marriage. A In good other marriage. words, the wine is from Tuscany and the meat is from Tuscany. Exactly. You don't want to have a wine from somewhere else. Tuscany. Ah! <laughs> wow. I love that. And that's your steakhouse in Florence. And, you know, it reminds me, it's so important for us travelers to have a proper philosophy about eating. We want to eat locally and we want to eat with the season. Of course, as we learned from Tommaso there, this is Chianina beef. This is right here from Chianti region in Tuscany. And uh, I love the idea. Think about this, that a smart eater can go to a good restaurant and know just by looking at the menu what month it is and where they are. That would be the case in this restaurant. This is a classic restaurant, and it's a wonderful place to enjoy that Florentine specialty of the Chianina beef. Now, just down the street from here, there's a sculptor, and he's an amazing guy. And when I was doing my art series, I had a handful of actual um, uh, artisans that I, uh, kinds of art I wanted to portray. And one of those was a sculptor carving marble. And the interesting thing is that this process for carving marble is essentially the same from ancient Roman times through the Middle Ages, through the Renaissance, through the Baroque Age, all the way up to today. We're going to go now to look at a one minute clip out of our six hour series, Rick Steves Art of Europe. And we're going to visit with a sculptor and see how they do that magic with that stone called marble. By the way, whether in ancient times or in modern times, sculpting with marble is essentially the same process. The sculptor generally starts with a clay model. Making this is the creative work of the artist. Once this is finished, it's copied. An artisan can take it from there. From the clay model, a plaster cast is made. And then, with a pointing machine, corresponding points are copied. The sculptor starts with a raw piece of marble, chipping at first with a big chisel, then various finer chisels, then a rasp, and finally polished with sandpaper, creating the same timeless beauty as the ancients. Wow. So um, right now, I would like to take you to seven minutes of our Renaissance uh, art hour. Uh, that one minute we just saw with the sculptor in Florence, that was kind of fun for me because that was a little one minute module that could have gone in the ancient Roman section, it could have gone in the medieval show and it could have gone in the Renaissance show because it's the same process. I forget exactly where I put it, but I put it where I needed a minute. I had to cut these six hours into exactly 60 minutes each. Now we're gonna go to the Renaissance in Florence, and uh, we're just gonna take six minutes out of that one hour show. But I do wanna remind you, for all six hours, anytime you're heading off to Europe, anytime you got a friend or a loved one who's going to Europe that wants to better appreciate the sightseeing you're gonna do, that's the mission of this six hour series. And the whole philosophy is, the more understanding you bring to your sightseeing, the more you're gonna enjoy it. Here we go. The city of Florence was the epicenter of the Renaissance, and in so many ways the birthplace of our modern Western world. And for good reason. This was where capitalism was replacing feudalism. The city had money, and it knew what to do with it. Florence was a prosperous city, a producer of wool and fancy clothes well located along a busy river. 
Trade brought bankers who brought money. And wealthy businessmen showed their civic pride by investing in their city, commissioning splendid art from talented artists, artists who were now respected and well-paid. With all this going for it, Florence of the 15th century unleashed a cultural explosion. Three works by pioneering geniuses helped launch the Renaissance. The towering dome of its cathedral, the groundbreaking statues that decorated it, and the doors of its baptistry. Excitement over these bold projects by three greats of the early Renaissance, Brunelleschi, Donatello, and Ghiberti, sparked a citywide boom in art and creativity. To better understand the groundbreaking art of the early Renaissance, we're joined by my friend and fellow tour guide, Elena Fulcheri. Some say that the Renaissance truly started here in 1401, when the city arranged a competition to select an artist for the bronze casting of a new door of the baptistry. And the winning panel was made by a brilliant goldsmith named Lorenzo Ghiberti. Ghiberti, this is a self-portrait, won the competition with this panel. He then completed the north doors of the baptistry with additional panels like this. So the competition doors were on the north side. Exactly. And later on, Ghiberti was in charge of another wonderful project. He cast in bronze at the eastern door of the baptistry, which ended up being so revolutionary and so spectacular that it was nicknamed the Gate of Paradise. And as you can see here, Ghiberti was able to use also the rules of prospectiva, perspective, mathematical laws that help defining the three-dimensionality. And as you can see, there is a foreground, middle ground, and background. By doing this, Ghiberti creates a vanishing point that gives the illusion of depth, a believable 3D scene on a 2D surface. They were considered revolutionary for the three-dimensionality that they offered. It's like now the viewer is involved in the art. Exactly. We feel part of the artwork. It's three-dimensional. It goes way beyond the shape of the panel, and it's achieved by mathematical laws. And the next great Renaissance achievement was the construction of the dome for the cathedral. It was a huge medieval church that, after 120 years, was left incomplete with a huge hall. So the city really needed the proper technology and the right genius. And this genius was Filippo Brunelleschi. With his innovative eight-sided design, Brunelleschi was able to finish the largest dome in a thousand of years. And this is the essence of the Renaissance. You can see how art and science can create great beauty. The cathedral. So I do want to remind you that you just heard Elena there, and it is such a luxury as a traveler to have a local guide, an art historian, to walk you through and bring meaning to all the sites that you're so blessed to see. It's so important if you're going to go all the way there to understand what you're looking at. You know, when we do our tours, we do a thousand tours every year, Rick Steves Europe tours. Uh, we always have, um, I call them a guide, but uh, the conventional term is a tour manager, somebody on the bus that runs the whole tour for the two weeks or whatever. And they could tell you the stories and so on. But even though they would be able to do that, we really like to invest in a local guide who that's their specialty. That's Elena, for example, here. I also want to remind you, if you're going on your own, you can book all of these guides. Nearly everybody you ever see with me on the TV show, they're just hardworking, independent, business people, they're trying to fill up their calendar and book half a day here, three hours there, a full day there to earn their living. I just went to uh, page 46 in my Rick Steves uh, Florence book, Florence in Tuscany, and you've got, you know, five people that I really enjoy who are private guides, and Elena is one of them. You know, you can use the book, you can download the app and have the tour in your ear. That's a free option. You can take a public tour with a bunch of people sharing the cost of a guide, or if you can afford it, you can hire your own private guide like we saw right there. Drill and its soaring bell tower were landmark accomplishments in architecture, and they were to be decorated inside and out with wonderful statues. For this, Florence turned to Brunelleschi's good friend and Ghiberti's assistant, the sculptor Donatello. An eccentric, innovative, workaholic master, Donatello lit up his statues with an inner soul, giving his subjects unprecedented realism and emotion. This balcony, from where the choir sang, captures the exuberance of the Renaissance. 
dancing and swirling in a real space, unconstrained by columns, Donatello's happy angels celebrate the freedom and spirit of this new age. His Mary Magdalene, carved out of wood, is provocative, shockingly realistic. Rat carved out of wood, 500, more than 500 years ago, and thankfully, beautifully preserved in the Museo del Duomo, the museum of the cathedral, just behind the cathedral. No crowds there. All the crowds are at the Uffizi. This is all yours, Donatello. Other than a saint in glory, Donatello portrays a real person whose entire being is about the spiritual rather than the physical. Hands folded in prayer and emaciated from fasting, she's repentant. While her neglected physical body seems fragile, she exudes strength and spirit with a faith that salvation will be hers. Before the Renaissance, church architecture, because it was the house of God, was the most noble art form. Other arts, like statues, paintings, and stained glass, were especially worthwhile if they ornamented the church. With his bronze David, Donatello helped revolutionize sculpture. Renaissance man now stands on his own. This is one of the first freestanding nudes sculpted in Europe in a thousand years. While the formal subject is still biblical, David slaying the giant, truth be told, it's a classical nude, a celebration of the human body. Driven in part by artists, society was changing. A generation before, this would have been shocking. But with the Renaissance, it's art for art's sake, adorning not a church, but a noble family's courtyard. By the late 1400s, the Florentine Renaissance was in full bloom, and that exuberant spirit is best found in the big colorful paintings of Sandro Botticelli. As a member of the Medici Circle, he was even a friend of Lorenzo the Magnificent. He studied their collection of ancient statues. Botticelli found inspiration in the balanced compositions, the naked beauty, and secular humanistic outlook. As he painted, he created visions of pure beauty that capture the optimistic springtime, or primavera, of the Renaissance. Mm. The epitome of early Renaissance beauty may be Botticelli's Birth of Venus, the first large-scale depiction of a naked woman in a thousand years. Born from the foam of a wave, Venus is just waking up. The world itself seems fresh and newly born. The god of the wind sets the whole scene in motion. Floating ashore on her scallop shell, Venus takes center stage. Botticelli creates an ideal world, perfectly lit. The bodies curve harmoniously. The faces are idealized, and their gestures exude grace. Naked as a newborn, Venus symbolized the optimism of the Renaissance. By the year 1500, what had begun in Florence a century earlier was coming to a peak, an exciting time known as the High Renaissance. Italy was thriving, with a huge appetite for art. Artists who in earlier times had toiled as anonymous craftsmen were now famous and well-paid. Three towering artists, all with Florence connections, brought the Renaissance to its culmination and then helped spread it throughout Italy and beyond. Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael. Wow, and we're not going to see any of them. What a cruel tease. <laughs> I want to remind you, we just saw seven minutes. There's, what, 353 more minutes in the Rick Steves Art of Europe series if you want to bone up on the art before you head out on your trip. That's your way to make up for all those hours you were sleeping in your history and art classes before you knew you were going to Europe. Now you got a trip coming up and you wish you remember who the Etruscans were. And what's the big deal between Romanesque and Gothic? If you just take 15 minutes with me on this art series, learning about Gothic architecture, you'll step into a Gothic cathedral, excitedly nudge your partner and say, isn't this a marvelous improvement over Romanesque? Can you imagine being turned on by Gothic?
Hey, speaking of being turned on, I'm on the top of a beautiful hotel here, Hotel La Scalata. It has a roof garden overlooking the Boboli Gardens. And I'm so lucky with my work, whether it's taking groups to the neatest little places in town or writing guidebooks and recommending this family that runs this hotel or running around town desperately looking for a good spot for an on-camera and thinking, yeah, I can go to Barbara's hotel, Hotel La Scalata, and I can go up on the rooftop. They'll let us do it. And look at that. It just worked perfectly. Oh, my goodness. I'm so excited to have this show in the can. And it's so great to be able to share all of this wonder of Florence with all of you. Thanks so much for being with us. And now uh, let's go back to Gabe, because I think it's time for a few questions. Rick, we have many more questions in the Q&A widget than Lisa and I can even keep up with and some great ones for you. Before we get to those, uh, do we have a quick word from our sponsor this evening? Well, sure. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, $10 half price, greatest t-shirt, men's sizes, women's sizes. You'll be happy to have this around Europe because it's exuberant. You got yours too, Gabe. Keep on traveling. Nice. Keep on traveling, baby. <laughs> So if you want to keep on traveling t-shirt, if you don't get it in the next 24 hours, she'll just, it'll gnaw at you and you'll end up paying 20 bucks for it because you'll come back to ricksteves.com and buy one sooner or later. But I really enjoy being able to have this and it kind of, we're, we're sort of a family of people that love to travel this way. But you know, we are um, a gang of a uh, hundred. There's you and me, Gabe, and 98 others at Rick Steves Europe. And we're all mission driven. Our mission is to equip and inspire Americans to venture beyond Orlando hey, let's go to Europe. And you can do it because you can learn from our experience and travel smoother. That's for sure. Uh, the big news for us is we're back in the black. We're like, guidebooks are selling like mad. Tours are selling like mad. And uh, we're happy to be out of COVID from a business point of view. And uh, I think we've got 31,000 seats sold now on our tours this year. And we still got a few thousand seats left. There's 40 different itineraries. Uh, and of course, we've got 2024 coming up. But if you are curious about traveling, whether you want to get a guidebook and do it on your own, or whether you want to let us do the driving and arrange everything and take one of our tours, um, hey, visit our website and we'd love to be part of your travels. Okay, let's have some questions. All right, Rick. Um, as is often the case after our Monday night travel presentations, people are all excited about traveling to whatever destination we've covered. And tonight was no exception. Our first question comes from Kevin, who is wondering, if you want to go to Florence, what is the best time of year to go? Well, I'll tell you the worst time. It's July and August, just because it's so hot and so crowded. It's, it's the student break. A lot of students are there, a lot of school groups there. And it's just brutal hot. I mean, if that's your only option, well, it's certainly better than nothing. But if you can steer your trip into shoulder season, you're doing yourself a huge favor. If you look at our tour sales, there's like two humps. There's spring and then there's fall. In May and in September, we have 100 buses on the road at the same time. It dips way down in the middle of the summer. And with climate change, it's just getting hotter and hotter. So um, I would go into stroller season. By the way, I was just there in late November as we were doing our guide mentoring tour. Every winter, I go with 25 of our guides and I teach them how to do the tours the Rick Steves way. And I did two guide mentoring tours this last November and December. These are experienced professional guides, but they want to work with us. And I want them to travel specifically with me so they know exactly what distinguishes our tours. But it occurred to me, Gabe, when we were in Florence, we were having a great time. There was none of the intensity of the crowds. There was none of the sweaty heat. And the city was just very into its own groove. I mean, it was a, a, the Florence of the Florentines. And I've even got... Uh, photographs of my my guides who were my tour members because they were guides taking my tour and learning how to be Rick Steves tour guides. But I, I took a photograph of them just dressed properly. Go in the dead of winter if you want to. It's cheaper and just dress like you're going skiing and you've got no crowds and none of that stress. Rick, we have another question from Donnie who is wondering, would you recommend having Florence as your home base? Or could travelers also consider maybe having Siena as a home base and then commuting into Florence to see uh, segments? Well, the Siena and Florence is interesting, Gabe, because it's a one hour taxi ride. It's a one hour bus ride. It's a one hour train ride between the two. I mean, you can take the bus for 10 bucks or something and you got it. Um, I would not be a big fan of staying in either place as a home base. I like to be in those towns early and late because of the, their popularity. Italy is the most popular destination in Europe. And the fact is, 
I'm just making it worse. I'm sending everybody to the top 10 cities in Italy. And do yourself a favor by being, when you sleep there, take advantage of those early morning hours and the late hours because tourism really packs the streets and the museums, and the galleries and the shops and the restaurants, you know, in the middle of the day from 10 till five, that's crowded time. Eight till 10, five till eight, it's really more relaxed. So I love the twilight. I love the passeggiata. I love the strolling in the pedestrian streets, licking a gelato after everybody's back in their hotel rooms. So spend your night in these towns uh, rather than home basing. Having said that, if you really want to be home basing, Florence is a better home base because you've got public transit going out like a, like, um, like um, spokes from a hub, you know. So you can, from Florence, you got buses and trains going everywhere, and you could spend 10 days side tripping from Florence and never run out of exciting places to visit. And one of those is Siena. So one thing that you talked about, Rick, was the food in these places. And um, Jackie was asking a question that I thought was interesting. Um, a lot of times you talk about avoiding some of these tourist trap restaurants with their big English menus and finding these more authentic local restaurants. Do you find that these local, re these restaurants that cater to locals are also welcoming to tourists or uh, are there times that they kind of don't want the tourists there? Or is there a way that tourists can be more respectful of knowing that this is more of a local space? That's a very good question, Jackie. And um, I would say in Florence, every restaurant's got tourists. I mean, you know, and they want your money and they want to do a good job and they believe in the quality and they'll be fine. They'll sometimes they'll roll their eyes because you don't you're drinking coffee with your dinner you know or something like that <laughs> but but they'll i mean they'll they'll feed barbarians just like they'll feed highly cultured people um i would remind you what they don't want is a big noisy tour group 50 people come in invade a place and they just slam out the spaghetti bolognese and then they're on their way you know in the table wine um so you want to I, I i don't like you know I often wonder what what distinguishes the restaurants I really like, and I mean I I'm not that sophisticated where I under, where I appreciate the finest food I don't think, but what I really love is the the real ambiance. It hurts my traveling soul to be surrounded by noisy tour groups. Um, I like to be in a restaurant without the noisy tour groups. And when I'm talking about noisy tour groups, I'm talking about the standard fifty noisy people from you name the country. Um, our groups are 25 people and we travel in a way where we become temporary locals and we are respectful. We want to keep it, you know, we don't want to be a commotion for that restaurant. Um, restaurants like us, I would remind you, you can go to one of my favorite restaurants at seven o'clock and it'll feel like a tourist trap because only Americans and tourists are eating at seven o'clock. You can go back to that same restaurant at nine o'clock and there's not an American in sight because the Italians come out at nine o'clock and they eat until 11. So you got to decide, do you want to have that restaurant a little less demanding and a little more touristic and tourist friendly and go with all the tourists? Or do you want to come in in the evening when it's really high energy with locals? Um, it's two different experiences. Uh, and I, I, just, uh, I just think that's a beautiful part of eating. You can go late and you can eat with the locals. Rick, you also talked about the great art of Florence. And another question that I thought was interesting um, came from Tommy. And Tommy was wondering, is there any either street art or noteworthy modern art in Florence? Or are they just really doubled down on being this hub of classical or Renaissance mm -hmm. art? You know, we don't have the, 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 value, the benefit of time to judge what is great in our generation. It's kind of exciting because you look at something and you think, is that Donatello? I mean, quality, but it'll be much later that they recognize it. Who knows? We don't because we're in the middle of it. We can't, we can't tell the context. Um, but there's great cutting edge art in Florence. I'm, I'm not, it's not my thing, but in Florence, you've certainly got people that are all about this generation's contemporary art. There happens to be a very famous street artist in Florence named Clet, C-L-E-T. And uh, you'll see his uh, graffiti all over town. He takes the no entry sign. It's a red dish with a white slash on it. it means no entry. Have you seen these, Gabe? And he, he does all sorts of very clever um, ways to muck up that sign and turn it into something really, really, really fun. 
um, and there's street artists all over Europe. That you know, when we did our six-hour art series, we started with cave paintings, thirty thousand years old, and we finished with street art. And I just love that there's sort of it bookends the whole thing, and it's people's art. Street art gives voice to people that normally don't have voice. They're not powerful people. They got to paint after midnight on the street, and uh, there's a lot of that all over Europe, including Florence. Um, Rick, another question um, comes from Bianca, and she's wondering, what are some good off the beaten path sites in Florence? Things that people might not see if they're only spending a day or two there, but if they spend three or four, um, mm -hmm. they would have time to see. You know, um, if you go to TripAdvisor, and I, I just ignore the eating and sleeping stuff in TripAdvisor, I go to TripAdvisor for things to do. Anything that has a turnstile is listed in TripAdvisor things to do Florence. And I would say, who knows, three quarters of all the tourists, they go to the same top 10 sites. Those are great. And that's, you know, understandably where I would focus also. But if you want to see charming sites that have no crowds that really are important, there's dozens of great sites in Florence uh, that you'll find lower on that TripAdvisor things to do listing. Um, uh, that would be a tip that works anywhere in Europe. Also, you got to remember, if you read um, publications that get you into what's happening today, kind of periodical uh, entertainment kind of with our temporary exhibits, there's all sorts of stuff going on. That's a whole nother strata of the public, people that are going to great venues for visiting shows. You see, if you're going to the Uffizi and if you're seeing David and you're going to the Duomo, you're not even thinking about temporary exhibits, but there is that whole other dimension of artistic sightseeing, and that would be much more local and much less touristy, I would say. I remember seeing a visit visiting exhibit at the Gustavianum in Uppsala, Sweden, of like Egyptian sites like mummified alligators and yeah. so you, you can find very interesting travel. You know, when, when I was a, a kid and I wasn't working so hard and trying to update guidebooks, I spent a lot of time doing that, Gabe. The first thing I would buy at the airport was the timeout guide to every one of these cities, which is a quarterly or a monthly guide. And I'd see what are the what's happening now? What's what's where are the people? And um, but but, you know, most of us, when we go to Florence, we want to see the Botticelli's like we just showed in that last clip. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of beautiful opportunities to get into those um, less less commercial uh, cultural sites. And, you know, I'm a big fan of walking tours. There are so many specialized walking tours that you can do, and they will take you on different slices of that city. And uh, that opens up whole new venues also. All right, Rick, we have time for one last question tonight. Um, and that question is, so you've had you've had your beautiful experience in Florence, you've seen the art museums, you've had the wine, you've had good meals, and now you are ready to venture out from Florence to somewhere else in Tuscany. Mm -hmm. What are maybe your top couple picks of places that you would go in Tuscany after some time in Florence? Well, that's always a good question. And you got to remember, Italy has a great train system and Florence is a hub. And from there, within three hours, you could be in Venice, you could be in the Cinque Terre, you could be in Milano, and you could be in Rome. Those are the big things. Okay. Um, but also within just like an hour, you could be in Assisi. That's an amazing day trip. Uh, you could go to Lucca. And Lucca is the little sister town of... of um, Pisa, Pisa is famous for the Leaning Tower, of course. You could you could take away the Leaning Tower from Pisa and it would still be worth visiting. Pisa was a power in its day, a rival of Florence. And it's a beautiful place and you get out of the train and you just wander around. Of course, if you've got, I think uh, that Rick Steves guy, who wrote a book called Florence and Tuscany, and that lists all those places like Lucca and Pisa and Assisi. And um, the number one side trip for me would really be Siena. I'm crazy about Siena. And Siena is the home of the Palio. Siena is almost traffic free. Siena is a medieval time warp. And you can take the bus from Florence or the train from Florence and in an hour, you're in Siena. I would say, remember, you don't wanna be going too fast all the time, but you have a diminishing curve of, uh, of returns for the longer you stay in any one spot. I'm not saying day five is not great in Florence, 
but I'm saying it's not as good as day one or day two or day three or day four. If you got five days for Florence, you could take a lesser town, which only goes up to here on day one. So you'd want Florence on day one. But when you get down to day three, you're slipping below the joy of day one in Siena. Do you follow me there? I'm graphing the touristic joy. We're getting into a lot of math, right? <laughs> so <laughs> if, if you got five days in Florence, you could dedicate those last two days to side tripping and get more travel joy. But that's something that you got to be um, very mathematical, I guess, to appreciate. No, it's just so important. There's so much fun in Italy to have. And I would say the key is to don't um, to assume you will return because you will. If you're always worried about what you're missing, you're always going to be frustrated because you're always missing stuff. I'm planning trips right now and going to places I've always wanted to go and I've never had a chance to go to yet. So we can never exhaust Europe of what it has to offer. Gabe, thank you so much. And could you show us your t-shirt one more time? I love oh. the way you wear that t-shirt. Keep on I'm traveling. Not... There Keep you go. Traveling. <laughs> so I want, I'm just curious how many people are going to join the club. Remember for 24 hours, Keep on Traveling is in a blowout. It's just 10 bucks and it's right at ricksteves.com. Go to our website. Get into the travel store there and look under the accessories, wherever t-shirts are, and uh, you can get one of these shirts. Hey, uh, and I want to thank Lisa for answering all the questions and remind you uh, next week, Cameron is going to be meeting with Tomas. Tomas is going to be my guide when I'm filming there this uh, summer. And Cameron is the man for Poland and Poland is an exciting destination. That's next Monday on Monday Night Travel. It's so great to be with all of you. And I want to thank you for traveling with us. And I want to remind you, we're here every Monday. Happy travels.